Ah, bom dia, pessoal. É, obrigado pela presença aí de todos. Ah, vou fazer aqui um, um, alguns breves comentários em português antes de passar a palavra para o nosso palestrante. Hoje a gente tem o prazer de ter aqui o professor é, Dudmundson, da Universidade da Islândia, que vai falar sobre o modelo de plasma, mais especificamente de magnetron sputtering. Uh, fiquem à vontade para fazer perguntas pelo chat, eu vou selecionar elas, podem fazer em português, depois eu, eu traduzo aqui, tá bom? Uh, professor, uh, thank you again to accept this invitation, it's a pleasure to us uh, to, to see this talk. Uh, feel free uh, with the time, no, no hurry, so... Uh, Adin, thank you, and you can start at any time. Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the invitation. So today I will talk about the high power impulse magnetron sputtering discharge. And I will focus on a model we have developed to try to understand this discharge, a model we refer to as the ionization region model. Magnetron sputtering is a very widely used technique for thin film processing. It is just simply a diode discharge, a DC, uh, originally a DC discharge, where uh, two concentric stationary cylindrical magnets are placed behind the cathode target. These magnets create magnetic field that confines the electrons. Applications of this technique is, is various thin film uh, depositions for uh, integrated circuits, hard protective and wear resistant coatings, optical, all kinds of coatings. So this is a very highly used technique that uh, spans uh, various industries. A typical DC planar magnetron discharge is operated in a rather low pressure, 1 to 10 millitor. And the magnetic field is typically 10 to 50 millitesla. And the voltage applied to the cathode is a few hundred volts. The electron density is 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 16 per cubic meter. And this means that the fraction of the sputtered species that is ionized is very low, usually uh, about 1% or less. Most of the ions that bombard the, 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 the sample we are depositing on are ions of the inert gas or the argon ions. There have been maybe 30 years ago, in the 1990s, uh, there were attempts to increase the plasma density and the ionization fraction by adding a secondary discharge which is either inductive, like we see here in the center picture, where an RF coil is added between the target and the substrate, and with an ECR, electron cyclotron resonance discharge. These techniques have actually been very successful, and the inductive coil is added to the DC magnetrons that are used in the semiconductor industry. So this is very heavily used, even today. Uh, but to ionize the sputtered species, you need a very high density plasma. You need high electron density. And you can generally increase the, uh, the electron density by increasing the power density on the target. But then there is a problem. You cannot increase the power density to a DC magnetron forever because the target will melt. Will melt. So instead, you can do this by applying pulses, high power pulses, and keep the duty cycle low. So when you apply powerful pulses, high density, high power density pulses at low frequency and low duty cycle, and the same average power as in the DC discharge, you get what we call high power impulse magnetron sputtering discharge or high pins. And we see this here on this graph. We see here the duty cycle versus the power density. And if the duty cycle is high in the DC magnetron, we are limited in the, total, uh, the power density we can supply. 
And if we lower the duty cycle, we can increase the power density and then we have what is called high pins. So this is the basic idea. It is basically to avoid melting of the target as we increase the power density. We have done some measurements early on when we were developing this. And here we see a figure where we see the, the electron density uh, in uh, three dimensions versus time for different time. And we see that in the high pimps discharge, we get electron density that is of the order of 10 to the 18 to 10 to the 19. And this is high enough density to really get significant ionization of the sputtered species. <clears throat> and we see this, we can also see on the figure below here, where we see the electron density versus the peak discharge current. And if we operate in the DC magnetron range, we are here in the 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16. And in the high PIMS range, we go up to the 10 to the 19. So this is this figure shows a collection from various sources showing the density versus the discharge current. So by increasing the discharge current density, we can increase the electron density. So this is just to put the high pimps discharge into perspective with the with the uh, original technique. So then to film the position, why this is interesting. Uh, if we have a high fraction of ionization of the spotted species, we are able to grow smoother and denser films. We can control the phase composition and the microstructure by applying bias to the substrate. And this means we can really enhance the mechanical, electrical, or optical properties of the films. We can also improve film adhesion. So it is highly beneficial to be able to ionize the spotted species. We can also deposit high quality films on uh, complex shaped substrate. And we see here, the figure here on the left, the top figure shows that uh, 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 DC, grown by DC magnetron, we see here the diffraction pattern. And we see that the diffraction pattern shows much better crystalline films when deposited with high pimps in this case. The density of the films grown by high pimps is always higher, which is the red. Uh, bars in this curve compared to the green bars, which is the DC case. So we get a significant improvement of the film properties by using well uh, ionized butter species. Here is another example where we grow titanium nitrite with uh, the red. If you look at the curve here on the right, the red curves are with uh, DC. Uh, magnetron sputtering and the blue are with high pimps, the film resistivity is much lower when we grow with high pimps. And also we see that as we vent the chamber, the resistivity goes up for the DC grown films, but it remains the same when we vent the chamber for the high pimps deposited film. So both, so the film is both of better quality with terms of electrical properties. It is also much high, more highly resistant towards oxidation. So high pimps is significantly, uh, gave significantly better films in this case. Here is another example where we grow multi-layer structures of titanium oxide and silicon oxide to create a Bragg wind mirror. Because of high PIMS provides a, a smooth uh, surfaces, we can uh, grow a very well-defined stack that allows us to create this kind of structure. We have also explored this with molecular dynamic simulations. We, we looked at three cases, thermal evaporation, which is uh, kind of demonstrated as a fully neutral species. We look at half of the species being ionized and all of them. And we, we label this uh, thermal evaporation, DCMS, and high pimps. 
we are basically changing the ionization fraction of the special species. And we can see on the lower figure here that this means that the, the surface becomes smoother as more of the ions, uh, more, more of the special species is ionized. And we also see on the upper figure that the quality of the film improves significantly. So it is highly beneficial to use uh, uh, highly ionized flux fraction. So now, oh, and high PIMS is really a, a very good way of uh, getting, getting this done. But there is a drawback. The deposition rate for high PIMS is significantly lower often than for the DCMS if we operate at the same average power. And it is typically in the range of 30 to 85 percent of the DCMS rates, which depends on the target material, as we see in the figure here. So we see that the, the red is high PIMS, black is DCMS, and for all of these different uh, elements, the deposition rate in high PIMS is significantly lower. And this is very important problem in regards to, to the industrial use because they only care about the throughput. So in order to understand why this is so, we, we developed the ionization region model. And in, before I start to discuss this, we should look at the voltage current time characteristics of the high PIMS discharge. So to describe this uh, current voltage uh, relation, we need to really look at current voltage time space. So here the top figure shows the voltage and the lower figure shows the current. So the early high PIMS discharges that were created maybe 20, 25 years ago, they used a, a power supply that was not really able to maintain the the voltage pulse uh, throughout the pulse. So the voltage dropped as, as, as time progressed. So this is what we see in this graph. This is more, more of a historical figure. Uh, modern pulsers, they are able to maintain the, the voltage throughout the pulse. And so we have a square voltage pulse, but the current, develops a certain shape, as we see here. So, so these uh, current uh, curves here uh, are recorded for various combination of argon and nitrogen in the discharge. So the more nitrogen we put into the discharge, the later the current rise starts. And, uh, but the shape is always a peak. It, it, when the current starts, it goes to a peak, it drops, and then there is some kind of a plateau that follows. So this is always the case, or, or almost always, or, or the most common case. So in the non-reactive discharge, the non-reactive high pimps discharge, we see an initial peak, then a drop, and then some kind of plateau. So this is here a schematic of the discharge current behavior, given we have a square voltage pulse. So this is a schematic, and below we see an actual measurement. So this is the current in a discharge uh, with argon-nitrogen mixture operated at different uh, pulse frequencies. So we see this general shape. There is an initial peak, which we say is a pressure-dependent peak and depends heavily on the uh, the argon species, and then there is a drop, and then there is this plateau, which depends on self sputtering from the cathode target. And we get back to this uh, later on in the talk. So, so this is basically these curves is what we start with. So we set out to try to understand what these curves are telling us. This is the easiest thing to measure when operating a magnetron sputtering discharge. It's basically just the current and the voltage. So what can this tell us? 
So to understand this, we developed this ionization region model. So the ionization region model is really just a, a volume average model of the plasma chemistry in the ionization region that sits next to the cathode target. If you have ever seen a magnetron sputtering discharge in operation, <coughs> you see that there is a strongly glowing plasma next to the target. And that is basically the region we are trying to model in this, uh, this model. So we just define this as a cylinder, kind of a donut, a square donut, which has an outer radii, which we denote by RC2, an inner radii, RC1, and it extends from Z1 to Z2, where Z1 is basically the sheath width of the discharge, which actually is rather small in this case. And Z2 is usually of the order of two to five centimeters into the, into the discharge. So this is basically the, the uh, plasma volume we are modeling. And this is uh, shown here schematically in this, this figure. So we have here a, 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 a basically just a simple global model that is basically a set of ordinary differential equations, which gives the first derivatives of the electron energy on one hand and the particle densities for all the particles in the model or in the distance. So for the simple case, the non-reactive IRM, that consists of cold electrons and hot electrons. So cold electrons are basically the bulk electrons, while hot electrons are the secondary electrons that are accelerated across the sheet as they are emitted from the target argon, argon uh, bombarding, argon ions bombarding the target. So it is the cold electrons, the bulk electrons, and the hot secondary electrons. And then we have argon atoms. We have warm argon atoms, which I will explain later, and hot argon atoms. And then we have uh, metastable argon. We have argon ions. So this is the basic, uh, what we call the working gas. And then we have, so far, we have modeled titanium target and aluminum target. And then we have titanium atoms, titanium ions, titanium 2 plus, and similarly, aluminum, aluminum plus, and aluminum 2 plus. So this is basically the model. The ionization region model, we, we wrote a kind of a review article a few years ago, which is listed here on the bottom of the page, where we, we go through uh, all of the fundamentals of this model. So, to show you what is in the model, I describe uh, uh, all of the main terms here in, in some detail. So there is a particle balance equation for each species, and it is given by an equation like this. It is the time derivative of the density of this particular species it is equal to the sum of the reaction rates for this species. <coughs> and this reaction rate, can consist of volume reactions, which is basically a rate coefficient times the multiplication of densities of uh, the species involved. And usually, and I think almost, I think everything we include in the model are only two species. So it's only multiplication of two species. We don't uh, take into account uh, uh, three species reaction because the pressure is, is low. And then we get rates from different other sources. The first one being that particles can be sputtered off the target. This can be if we have aluminum target, then it is aluminum atoms. If we have titanium target, then it is titanium atoms. 
And if we have a titanium oxide target, then we can have titanium and all, and so on. So in case of, of titanium and nitrogen mixture, then we would have titanium and N coming off the target. So the sputtering of the target is described with this term here. And we also notice this is also some because there are various species that sputter off the target. And these various species have different sputter yields. So we can have in case of aluminum target, we have argon plus as one of the species. Aluminum plus is another and aluminum two plus would be one more. And in the case of reactive sputtering of titanium oxide, then we would have titanium, titanium plus, titanium two plus, O plus, O two plus, argon plus, and so on. So the more, so in reactive case, we have more species possible. And we will see this again later. So for each ion, there is also a loss rate in the balance equations. Due to the flux of ions uh, to the racetrack, so the species we see hitting the target to sputter, they actually go out of the chemistry uh, volume, the ionization region. So they are lost from that volume. And then there is also a flux of ions towards the substrate, so it means out of the modeled uh, regime, the ionization region. So we have flux of ions out of the region towards the substrate, and we have flux to the substrate, which causes the sputtering and creation of secondary electrons. And then we notice that we have a flux of species here to the target, and this flux is not only argon plus, it is also the ion of the sputtered species. And this is modeled by the equation below. So it is 1 over beta minus 1 times the density in the volume that basically goes out to the diffusion region. So here we basically take into account that certain fraction of the sputtered species is ionized in the ionization region and goes back to the target. So that means they are not available to go towards the substrate. And that is how we define this factor beta, which is a very important factor in this. And like I said before, it is the back attraction probability of the sputtered species. Okay. Uh, in a uh, magnetron sputtering discharge, it is well known that gas rarefaction lowers the density of the working gas inside the ionization region. So the density in the ionization region or the region next to the cathode target has lower density than outside of this region. And that means that there is a backflux of in this case, most of the cases are gone atoms into this ionization region. And this is then given by the original density in the burst plasma outside the ionization region minus the density in the ionization region, which is now lower. So there is a net flux into this region. And this can be flux of argon or in the case of reactive sputtering O2. So this is a, 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 a term which adds to the argon and the O2 in the, the system. The return flux is uh, of, uh, of argon is basically argon ions that come from the, uh, the, the that uh, hit the target and they uh, end up in two groups of atoms with different temperatures. So we have a flux of argon ions to the target, and they have there are two possibilities. They can either uh, hit uh, or be recombined next to the target, 
That means that they have very high energy when they return from the target. So, so this the hot component is then argon that returns from the target with a typical sputter energy, which is a few electron volts. So this is an argon ion that hits the target and, and uh, maintains the energy of the sputtered species. And this is we, we, we mark as hot. And then there is a warm component, which are argon ion that, uh, or argon atoms that become embedded into the target when they enter the target as an ion. And then they diffuse to the surface and leave. And these we assume have the temperature of the target, which is about 0.1 electron volt. So we have hot argon, which has a few electron volt energy, and warm, which have about 0.1 electron volt. And recall that the argon gas is usually, we can assume, uh, just about the, the room temperature. So there the temperature is about 25 milli electron volt, or maybe somewhat above that, maybe 50 milli electron volt. So we see that we have argon atoms at three different temperatures. But this means that there is a loss since these higher energy argon, they have then some velocity, and that means that they can be relatively easily lost out of the ionization region, which is modeled by this equation here. So then, then we have to look at uh, one important term. Uh, there is also a change in the neutral density in the ionization region due to kick out collisions by the fast sputtered atoms coming from the target. So the sputtered species, aluminum or titanium, when they come from the target, they have usually energy that is of the order of the binding energy of the atom in the solid. So this is a few EV. So these atoms have a, a tend to have collisions with the argon atoms which means that they can kick them out of the ionization region. And this collision, which is basically a moment of transfer, is uh, described by this equation here. So this is basically a collision between the sputtered species and the, the argon atoms, and uh, means that they, they can be kicked out of the ionization region. And in this equation, we have a term here that describes the probability of uh, collisions with the, the sputtered species. So this basically, all of these terms is, is what is uh, the base of the ionization region model. So, so then we can look at the results of the model and how we, we do this. The IRM is basically a semi-empirical model in the sense that it uses a measured distance current waveform and actually a measured voltage, voltage waveform as the main input parameter. So we feed it with the current and the voltage, and then this is used to basically, uh, the model is used to reproduce these waveforms. So here we see an example of this. The top uh, figure shows the measured values of the current for different voltages in a high pimps discharge, and the lower curve shows the, the model results. And this we do by fitting a few fitting parameters. Uh, these experimental values are, are taken actually from a well-known paper by Andre Anders from 2007, and we, we basically just use their measured values and, and try to model this. So the model is adapted to the to an existing discharge. So we take 
the geometry, the pressure, the process gas, the sputter yields, target species, and the reaction set for, for these species into the model. And then we fit three parameters. And actually, usually we only fit two. Sometimes we need the third one. And these parameters are the voltage drop across the ionization region, which we uh, list as VIR. And this basically accounts for the power transfer to the electrons in the plasma bulk. And the other fitting parameter is this back attraction probability of the ions of the sputtered species back to the target, which I discussed before. So, so basically the model takes in the, the, the current waveform. We assume that the voltage Usually now in, 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 in newer power supplies, the voltage is just a square. So we take in the current and then we try to, by adjusting these two parameters, we try to reproduce the current waveform. So this is basically how the, the model was originally designed. So here are some of the results of our work. So here we see and this, this is basically the same curves as we see here, as, as in the lower graph, and we pick out uh, three different voltages. So first is 360 volts. We see the discharge current is in few hundred milliampere uh, range. So this is basically what we are used to for the, uh, it's, it's slightly above what we are used to for the DC magnetron. The second one here is at 400 volts, and then we see the current is a few amperes, which is a high current. And then we go to 800 volts, and then we see a few tens of amperes, which is extremely high current. So, and we see in the case of 360 volts, that the current is mostly comp Post of argon ions. And we see that, uh, you know, I lost. Uh, so, and we see that at 800 volts, the current is mostly composed of aluminum ions. So, we are going here from the DC range to the high PIMS range. And we see that the composition of the discharge changes. And I go over this here. So, in the middle, at 400 volt, we see that we see still a few amperes, but the current is composed of argon ions and aluminum ions almost 50 50. And at the highest, we see almost dominating by aluminum plus. And that means that in this case, we are in the self sputter range. So this is the high pimps operation. So here is more results. This is for titanium. And here we have two different uh, discharges. We have varied here the magnetic field strength. We see in this case, we see that we have argon plus almost half the current. And then we have titanium plus. And now we see a significant fraction of titanium 2 plus. If we go back to the aluminum, we see that there is almost no aluminum 2 plus. It's almost entirely aluminum plus. So we see that there is some difference here. And this has to do with that the second ionization potential of aluminum is higher than that for argon. So there is not much uh, creation of aluminum 2 plus. We can also look at other things. And here is a result from one of our early papers on the model. So here we are looking at uh, the aluminum case. We are using uh, looking at the voltage of 450 volts. So this is basically the same data as or from the same data set as before. Uh, the, the peak distance current now is 12 amperes. And we are here, this is the current, 
So uh, the red line is the, the measured current and the blue is modeled that it fits exactly. And we see here various things as the electron density, the, the electron temperature, and here is the argon density, and that is basically what we will look, look at now. We see that the argon density drops significantly as the pulse progresses. So this is the rarification of the argon gas. We see here the ionization fraction, so the upper curve, the red curve here, shows that uh, over 60% of the aluminum is ionized in the peak of the current. So at the peak uh, in the current, we get over 60% of the aluminum ions ionized. The fraction of the argon that is ionized is much, much lower. So what is interesting here is to look at the cause of the rarefaction of the gas. So we see here that the argon density drops from about 4 times 10 to the 20 to 2 times 10 to the 20. So it's almost a 50% drop in the argon density. And the reason for this is what we see here. So there are these are the two contributions, biggest contributions to this. And it is uh, basically what is called the sputter wind. And that is when the sputtered species kick out the argon atoms and the other one the red curve which is the dominating term here is the ionization of the argon so what we basically see in the study is that the main reason for the uh, uh, rarefaction in the hyper discharge is basically the electron impact ionization of the working gas, but the sputter wind has also a significant contribution, as you see. So this is uh, one interesting result from, from the model. Okay, let's now move to the reactive case, which is actually a, a bit more complicated case. So in reactive sputtering, we add a reactive gas to the inert working gas. And this can be O2, N2, or, or some other gases. And, and here we only look at the argon nitrogen or argon oxygen. And in this figure, we see a discharge with an argon nitrogen mixture. We have a 400 microsecond long pulse. And we, we, start here with 80 hertz pulse frequency and then we lower the pulse frequency and what we see as we lower the repetition frequency we see an increase in the discharge current so the lower the frequency the higher the discharge current and this is actually counterintuitive so this is not what we would have expected so this uh, is something that is worth exploring further. We did the same with argon oxygen with a titanium target. So we start here at 30 or uh, at 20 hertz. So is if we lower increase, no, let me see. We start at 50, I say, and when we lower the frequency, we first lower the current. And then if we lower the, uh, the, the pulse frequency further, we start to see a significant increase in the current. And not only does the current increase, it also changes shape. It uh, moves from the, the shape that we discussed before for the non-reactive case to becoming a, a triangular in shape. So this was even more interesting. So so we actually saw this first experimentally, and we really did not understand what was going on in this case. So we, we published these two papers on this. And then we went on to explore if this also showed up in the current to the substrate. And indeed, we see 
we 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 put a, a, a probe on in the substrate region and then we also see an increased current to the substrate as we lower the pulse frequency. So indeed, this is a change in the discharge properties. And we can also see this as we vary. We, if you look at the upper figure here, we have the red curve shows the non-reactive case. The green curve shows when we add a little bit of oxygen and the blue shows if we add a lot of oxygen, we see how the curve uh, transitions into the triangular shape as we add more and more oxygen. So, so this uh, basically compares to what we see. A lot of oxygen is similar to low repetition frequency. So this is an interesting issue that we wanted to understand. So we applied the ionization region model. And this required that now we, we had the earlier model, non-reactive model, which we see here. And now we added oxygen to the discharge model. And we had recently published a, a revised uh, oxygen model and the results from this model, we, we took the most important reactions that we saw in this, this model and, and plug it into the IRM. And, and this allowed us to, to, to explore these changes in the current waveform. One important factor in this is that now, as we up, a reactive gas to the discharge, we are changing the conditions on the target surface. So when we add a little bit of oxygen, the target remains metallic. And then, so we add a little bit of oxygen, we are basically in what is called a metal mode, which we model with a pure titanium target. And in the case where we have a lot of oxygen, then we run into poison mode. The oxygen reacts with the target and creates titanium oxide. So we have these two kind of uh, extreme cases, a pure titanium target and a pure titanium oxide target. So the model needs to have the sputter yields for these two cases. So we have a sputter yield for the pure titanium is the upper graph, and the sputter yield for titanium oxide is the lower graph. You notice here that the sputter yield for the pure titanium target is generally much larger than for the titanium oxide. You also notice in the metal mode, you only have three ion species bombarding the target mostly, while in the, the uh, poison mode, you have many more species and many more combinations. But the most important fact is that the sputter yield for the pure titanium target is much larger than for the the uh, oxidized target, the titanium oxide target. So these sputter yields, they were calculated using this program Triton. And uh, this, this we use as an input to the model. So I said that the model needs to have experimental data. So what we did is for these two extreme cases, we used on one hand for the metal mode, we used the 50 Hertz curve. And for the poison mode, we used the 15 Hertz curve as the input to the model. So here are the results. First for the metal mode, this is the particle density versus time during the pulse. We see in this case that the argon, argon so these are the neutral species, so the argon neutrals are the dominating species. 
we see that there is a drop in the argon density during the pulse. And this is a uh, somewhat of a drop because this is a logarithmic scale. We see that the second most important species here is warm argon. So there is a significant number of argon atoms coming from the target. The third most important species is hot argon. So again, a significant fraction of the species is coming from the target. And we see that the titanium density is lower than both of these and the oxygen densities are even lower. We see that the O2 density is, uh, is uh, significantly higher than the O density. And we see that there is a much more significant drop in the O2 density due to gas rarefaction than for, for the argon. So this is the metal mode. So this is where we just have a titanium target. In the case of poison mode, we see a much more stronger rarefaction of the argon. We see now that the titanium density becomes the smallest density and is much lower than the O2 and O density. And now we see that the O density, the oxygen atoms, have a higher density than the O2. So now we see that the uh, dissociation fraction of the oxygen is quite high in the poison mode. So we see that the chemistry of the discharge is totally different in poison mode than in the metal mode. We have uh, explained the reason for the high dissociation fraction is that in the poison mode, and we actually here look at two cases, the upper graph is a transition mode. So it is where we have uh, somewhere in between uh, fully uh, poison target and a, a poison target uh, and a metal target and then a fully poison target. So we look at these two cases in these two graphs and we see that, and here we actually look at how the oxygen atoms are created. And it turns out that most of the oxygen atoms are created as they are sputtered off the target. So this is the really the dominating contribution to the O atom. So most of the O atoms in a discharge with poison target are sputtered off the target. And this is actually rather significant results. Uh, so if you look back at the metal mode, we see that the particle densities, we see that argon plus and titanium plus ions dominate in the metal mode. O2 plus and O plus have much lower densities. And the titanium 2 plus is somewhere in between. In the poison mode, however, argon ions dominate. And you see here that the argon ions have almost an order of magnitude higher density in the poison mode than the next ionic species, which is the O plus. So, so we see that in the poison mode, the discharge is dominated basically by argon ions. And we see this, so here is the contribution to the discharge current and argon plus and titanium plus in metal mode really contribute almost entirely to the discharge current in almost equal contribution, while in the poison mode, almost all the current is carried by argon ions. And in both cases, the contribution of secondary electrons is very small. And this is also a very important result from this. So basically, it means that the the high pinch discharge is not maintained by secondary electron emission from the target, which is or was believed to be the case, but we, we have shown that that is not the case. And what we have 
By this study found is that the recycling of atoms from and from the target and then ionized is basically required for both these modes of operation. So in order to maintain this charge current of the order of few amperes or tens of amperes or even hundreds of amperes, we need to recycle the ions coming from the target. And this recycling means both recycling of argon, the working gas ions, and the metal ions. And this is very important. The high pimps discharge is operated on recycling. So that means that we have two modes of recycling. We have self sputter recycling, which dominates in metal mode, and in poison mode, working gas, working gas recycling dominates. So we have two types of recycling modes, one in metal mode and another one in poison mode. And I will, I will go into this in more detail. And it is what we, 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 we claim is that the dominating type of recycling determines how the current waveform looks like. So what I'm saying by this is that if the waveform looks like we see here in this figure, we see this initial peak, a drop to to rarefaction, and then a plateau, this means that we are in some kind of self sputter recycling. If we, on the other hand, see the triangular shape, that means that the discharge is operating in a working gas recycling. We have not uh, completely proven this, but we believe this is the case. Okay. Uh, now I have only been describing this as a model result. But recently, this has been demonstrated experimentally by another group, the one in, in Bochum in Germany. They have tested this with a chromium, chromium target in argon oxygen mixture. And they see as they increase the coverage of the, uh, in their case, they look at the racetrack they can see this transition occur from, from the metal mode to the poison mode. And they see it develops in the triangular shape. We can see this here. So this, the, the, the curves on the, the right, they show the, the uh, metal fraction on the surface. And as, we, as the metal fraction is decreased, the uh, current waveform transitions into the triangular shapes. So this uh, more or less verifies our model results very nicely. Okay, so this is the ionization region model. And what I have now mentioned is that there is a significant recycling. So we have now looked at the recycling and to try to develop a more clearer picture of this. And from the results I just discussed, we see that the discharge current is basically composed of the working gas ions and the ions of the sputtered material. So we have two types of ions in the system. And we can write the discharge current, which we denote by ID, as the self sputter current, which are basically the metal ions going back to the target, and the argon ions that uh, come from the target and return to the target, and then what is called the primary current, which is basically the uh, argon ion, argon gas atom that is ionized once and goes to the target. And we can show that this current is actually rather small fraction of the total current in the high pimps distance. 
So, so basically, the total distance current is composed of these three components. And what I have been saying is that the large fraction, and the, actually the largest fraction of these ions in the high beam distance have to be recycled. And we have defined a few parameters here. The first, the working gas sputter parameter, which is uh, we call pi g, which is the probability of ionization of the sputter species, the return probability times the return fraction during one pulse. And this means that we can write the total current that is carried by the argon ions as basically this primary current times some multiplication factor, which depends on this pi. Okay, so this is for the working gas. We can do the same for the self sputter current. It is basically this current due to the gas ions times some multiplication factor, which now depends on the ionization probability, the Bach-Catroxin probability, and the sputter yield. So the total current is this primary current multiplied by the gas ions multiplication factor and the sputtered species multiplication factor. So basically it means that we have some seed current that is multiplied to the, to, to the recycling. And so this is what we have. The total current is the primary current, which is what I call here the seed current. This current is usually around the typical current in a DC magnetron. So this is in a few, few tens or hundreds of milliampers at most. So this is usually rather low current, and then this is multiplied by these two multiplication factors, and that is how we get to currents of the order of amperes or tens of amperes, and in some cases, hundreds of amperes. So, so this is the way to really understand how this, this works. So we see this in this graph here on the right. We have a primary current. It is multiplied by the gas multiplication factor, which again is multiplied by the, the self-sputter factor. And then we can either get this generalized recycling and there, there can be cases where the pi for self sputtering can be larger than one. And then we can go to into what is called self sputter runaway, where the distance current keeps increasing. Okay, and we can plot this into what we call a recycling map. We can define the different types of discharges on this map. So here we have the fraction of the current so on the y-axis we have the fraction of the current that goes into self sputtering and on the y-axis we have the fraction of the current that goes into gas recycling so if we have a value here of the primary current over the uh, total current as 39 percent we can mark it here on the graph and then we can read off this graph really the fraction of the different current. And for if the primary current over the total current is, let's say, larger than 0.85, if almost all the current is only primary current, then we are here. And this is the DC discharge, DC magnetron sputtering regime. So this is basically uh, the low, low current regime. Okay, so if the if self sputtering is more than fifty percent of the total discharge current, we say that the discharge is self sputter recycle dominated, and we call this region A. If the gas recycling is over fifty percent of the discharge current. We call this uh, a gas recycle dominated, and we call this a discharge of type B. In between, 
we have both recycle uh, self battery recycling and gas recycling and we have this charge of type AB. Okay, so this is the idea between these recycling maps. So now let's look at some of the cases we have discussed. If we look at the aluminum, we see that from the graphs I showed you before, as we increase the current, more increase the distance voltage, more and more of the current is composed of aluminum plus. So we go from low current and we move up and up on this on the y axis. So at 1000 volts, almost all the current is due to aluminum plus. So this means that aluminum forms aluminum target leads to a discharge of type A. So it is entirely self sputter recycling. Another case that has been discussed is an important case actually industrially is the case of carbon. And here we see two values. So first, if we operate carbon in this case, this is on a small target, uh, around 1000 volts, uh, carbon is basically in the DC regime. But if the voltage in increased up to 1150 volts, the, the distance current increase and is composed of both self sputter recycling and, and argon gas recycling. So carbon is kind of a, a AB type discharge. Okay, we have looked at more cases. Here are some more cases. Copper turns out to be very much self sputter recycling. And I discussed aluminum before. That is also self sputter recycling. Carbon is here. And here we have added also titanium oxide. And in this case, almost all the current is carried by argon ion. So we end up here on this graph in, in type B type discharge. So in, in reactive sputtering of titanium target that is operated in poison mode, we get a type B discharge. We actually have also figured out that for high self sputter yields, if, if the self sputter yield is, is larger than one, we have a type A discharge and self sputter recycling is dominating. If the self sputter yield is low, less than 0.2, then we have a type B discharge that has a dominating working gas recycling. So, so this is what we have seen from these studies. So this basically, if I go back to this, this means that the uh, type A discharge would likely form a, a, a discharge waveform that looks like the non-reactive case, while the B type discharge would form a, a discharge waveform that is triangular in shape. We can take this further into what we call recycling loops. So the upper case here is the aluminum case where the argon really contributes, not con does not contribute very much to the total discharge current. Most of the discharge current is due to recycling of the aluminum. As we see here, the aluminum circle here is much wider than the one for aluminum. And the lower one shows the titanium oxide where argon plays the dominant role and the titanium plus and oxy O plus play a smaller role. So, so this is what we see. So, so the upper curve shows the high self butter yield. The lower one shows low high self butter yield. <coughs> so for so now I have used the model to explain what we have observed experimentally. And in this case, with the titanium oxide forming on the substrate, we see that the working gas recycling dominates, which explains the shape of the current waveform 
in the case of low pulse repetition frequency or high oxygen flow rate. So these experimental curves here were actually the motivations for the study, and it actually took us a few years to, to be able to, to explain this. So to summarize, so I have shown you that the current voltage time waveforms in reactive discharge, they have, in the case of metal mode, similar characteristics as the non-reactive case. So the current rises to a peak, which then decays because of rarefaction, and then rises again to a, a plateau, which is the self-sputtering dominated phase. In other cases, they, we get the triangular shape of the waveform, and uh, basically means that we get a poison target and uh, gas uh, sputtering or, or, or gas sputter recycling is the dominating process. We also know that the secondary electron yields is higher for nitrate and oxide target than uh, titanium target when self sputtering is the dominating sputter mechanism. But uh, as I said before, it turns out that uh, secondary electron emission seems to play a rather minor role in this case and actually in the operation of the high pimps discharge and actually a much smaller role in the operation of DC magnetrons than, than previously suggested. And we also see that in, when we operate in, in reactive sputtering in metal mode, we see in this case with titanium target that argon plus and titanium plus ions dominate and are of the order of same order of magnitude, while in the poison mode, argon ions dominate the discharge and uh, uh, have a much higher order of magnitude than, than other ions in the system. So in metal mode, self the recycling dominates, and in the poison mode, working gas recycling dominates. And this I am trying to show you that this shows up in the discharge current waveform. So thank you for your attention. And uh, as you can see here, you can download the slides from my homepage. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, it's a very nice talk. Uh, it's a lot of information, so it's very good. Lots of information. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> To the audience, uh, feel free to make questions. Uh, we will start with a question from a student. I think it's about no reactive sputtering. Uh, in fact, uh, two questions on the screen. Uh, the first one is why do different species contribute differently to torrent at different voltages? I think that uh, why uh, when you we change the voltage in non reactive sputtering, uh, aluminum ions uh, become dominant, while in the uh, low voltage regime, iron ions are the dominant species. Yes, this this is actually it is a good question, and and uh, the, the, the it, it is actually. Uh, rather complex reason, but I think the main factor is actually the sputter yield. So it is actually seems to be that the sputter yield the kind of dictates the the plasma composition in the district. So that is one of the factors, but there, there are other factors because you are changing by by uh, by poisoning the target, you are also changing, like I said here, the the secondary electron emission yield. You are changing the the often the voltage on the target, and the voltage again influences the sputter yield. So, and then the the plasma composition uh, as you get uh, species sputtered of the target you're also changing the, the the composition of the plasma 
So this yeah. is a, a very complex uh, process, but the main factor seems to be the spatter yield. I understand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question uh, from the same student. In fact, uh, it's uh, uh, a little. Uh, he asked a little explanation about self sputtering. What is self sputtering? Yes, uh, self sputtering. Yes, it is true that I did not uh, explain this uh, mm -hmm. in detail. So self sputtering is basically that you you release an atom from the target. So, so as as you as you get an argon ion hitting the target, you release an, a metal atom. This metal atom gets ionized in the ionization region, and some of these ions return back to the target and sputter off another metal atom. But this means that the metal ion that was came back to the target is lost to our process. So, so the fact that you, you, you release an atom, you ionize it, and it returns back to the target and uh, sputters another one, that is self-sputtering. So it means that a metal atom is sputtering off another metal atom from the same uh, type, of the same type. So that is self sputtering Okay, thank you. Uh, I have some questions also. Uh, the first one, uh, when you you show uh, that for poisoning mode, you have uh, you have a triangular shape on the current waveform for uh, using oxygen. I I would like to ask if he, for nitrogen we achieve charge or other reactivities, you you have a triangular shape also, or it is specific for oxygen? Uh, so, so here, do you see you see my view graph still? Yes, it? yes, yes. So here is the case of nitrogen. So in this case, we do not, we have not been able to see the triangular shape. That is some but, idea why. <laughs> so, uh, so the, the the reason on this, we we are actually planning to model this as well. But I believe that the the sputter yield. So in this case, if you add nitrogen, we form titanium nitrite on the target surface, and probably the sputter yield of tar titanium nitrite is. Uh, more similar to the titanium. So the sputter yield does not go down when we get uh, uh, form a titanium nitrate target. I, I, I would think this is the reason, but we, we, it remains to be, be proven. Understand. So, so in this case, we don't get, but as I showed you before, uh, in the case of what, what, what they did in Germany, they see the triangular shape form for the case of chromium with oxygen. Okay. So, so uh, there are so so there are different uh, scenarios that seem to depend on, and I believe they depend on the the sputter yield uh, uh, mostly. I understand. Well, thank you. Uh, another question. Uh... When you model modeling the we achieve discharge, we you can see the temporal evolution of uh, atomic oxygen and uh, other species that are not so easy to measure uh, experimental. Uh, do you have uh, or some group uh, is trying to measure uh, this kind of species like atomic oxygen during a discharge? This is actually, given what I said before, this is actually a very important thing to do, <laughs> especially try to compare the, the atomic oxygen behavior uh, between poison and metal mode targets. And there have been, there is, a, there is a, a group in Belgium that has done some of this. 
But uh, unfortunately, they have only measured or mostly measured very short pulses. Okay. But we we have we have some plan of 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 modeling their measurements. But uh, like I say, this is a, 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 a this is an opportunity. Yes. And especially in the case of 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 the reactive case when you have the the poisoned uh, surface, it would be very interesting to see how the oxygen atoms behave. But I am not, uh, I, I would think that the oxygen atoms are, can be quite fast. So, so this uh, requires probably uh, some uh, talif or some that kind of yeah. measurement. Probably. But this yeah. is a very, very good point and, and probably very important to study. Uh, another question. Uh, the magnet field is probably the most important parameter in magnetron sputtering, uh, at least in DC uh, magnetron sputtering. Uh, how uh, it's not so clear to me when I study the model uh, in which way the magnet field is an input uh, on the model. Of course, it's uh, it's affect the the uh, the waveforms uh, that he is used to to uh, to fit the model. But uh, in the equations, it's not so so evident the the whole of the magnetic field. In this is this is an excellent question uh, because. Actually, uh, or the only thing we have been doing for probably the last two years is to explore the effect of the magnetic field. And it turns out that the magnetic field, uh, you said in the question that it is important in the DC magnetron sputtering, it is actually much more important in the high pinch case. So we, we have been able to show that you can increase the deposition rate by lowering the magnetic field and uh, all kinds of other things that uh, you can play with the magnetic field. So the magnetic field turns out to be extremely important, but also extremely complicated to deal with. And then I can answer the other part of the question. The magnetic field is not included in the model at all. It only goes in, like you said in the question, through the, the discharge current waveforms. So we have not included the magnetic field in the model, but uh, and we, even though now we are, we are trying to understand the influence of the magnetic field, we have still not incorporated this into the model because that is, this is a yeah, volume average, zero dimensional model, so there is really, uh, no possibility of incorporating the magnetic field, which is a, a more or less a three-dimensional structure. So we, we still just do this through the the uh, discharge current waveforms. Okay. So, so this is a very good point, and this is, seems to be an extremely important factor in this. Yeah. But, but most people have more or less neglected. So yeah. Far. Yeah, it's, uh, the magnetic field is uh, very complicated. Uh, yes, and, and it is not only very complicated, it also complicates the modeling effort significantly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I have another question. Uh, in high pins and uh, even in DC and S, uh, in the uh, ionization region, you have a voltage drop that it's uh, a little bit uh, higher than in a conventional load charge. So it's uh, some authors uh, say that it's, uh, it's at standard press shift. Uh, there is some measurements about this, uh, but I think that uh, probably, uh, I think we uh, talked about this uh, before, uh, probably it's affect the energy balance equation. Uh, can you talk to you a little about the the diffuse and, and the problems 
uh, to write the energy balance equation for hypens? Yeah, no, yeah, this so um, uh, so so there is a there is a, a a point in this. So so what which I did not really mention very much in the talk, but one so we have these two fitting parameters. One is this back attraction probability, and the other one is a voltage drop across the ionization region. And and, and, and like I say, I did not mention this very much, but this turns out to be extremely important uh, issue. Uh, so what we believed is that a significant part of the energy transfer to the electrons in the discharge is due to some kind of an ohmic process within the ionization region. This what this process is, we still don't understand. But it appears that there is, we have the sheath where most of the voltage drops, and then we have an extended pre seat in the discharge, which has some significant voltage drops, which is usually maybe about 10 to 20 percent of the voltage you apply to the cathode. So, so a significant portion of the voltage actually drops over the ionization region. So this also then enters our energy balance equation. And uh, this has actually uh, uh, the consequence that the... Uh, uh, high pimps discharge, like I have said a few times, that it is not maintained by secondary electron emission. It seems to be that this process, this ohmic process that we, we have not really been able to explain, is really the reason why you can maintain the high pimps discharge. And we have also demonstrated that this seems to be about 50-50 between secondary electron emission and this ohmic process is what maintains the DC magnitude. So, so this is a very important process that uh, we, we can only see that there has to be a power absorbed by the electrons due to this uh, voltage drop. But uh, the actual physical process, we, we have not been able to explain. So this is, this is uh, what I, I can say about this now. Yes. It's a huge to, to explore, I think. Uh, yeah, so it is kind of a, a, a it is, we, 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 we now use the voltage, the voltage drop as a fitting parameter that is really describes some uh, energy transfer prop, uh, mechanism that we, we still don't understand and is probably rather complicated. It probably has to involve some instabilities or, or some, some things like this. Okay. Uh, when do you model the uh, argon harefaction uh, in front of the target? Uh, the effect of sputter wind, it's uh, due to the collisions we, uh, of uh, sputtering species with the argon. Uh, did you include the, uh, the effect of adifation also due to hot argon, hot argon to leading with uh, neutron argons? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if it's relevant. I think, uh, let me, I need to look at these uh, graphs again, and now I... Uh, so... Uh, I am wondering if... Because this is... We, we did this work quite early on in the process, so... Yes, we included the hot and uh, hot argon and warm argon in this modeling as well. Okay. Okay. Yes, so it is, uh, but this is, it is 2012, so, so it is a while ago, but we seem to have been including this as well. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, we have in the audience some uh, students that are uh, beginning uh, to work with plasma modeling. So uh, I would like to, uh, that you could say something about uh, some uh, difficulties that you have in plasma modeling, especially input data, uh, especially cross sessions that are not, not so easy. Uh, for example, for titanium and other uh, metal atoms, it's not so simple uh, to have good uh, cross sessions. And, and sometimes we need to make some approximations. Uh, can you talk about a little uh, about this? It's yes, this is so. So actually, this is a, a good point because the, the, this actually. Argon is quite well covered. It is, uh, you can relatively easily find cross-section and data for argon. But for most of the metals, this is not so easy. And this is actually one of the reasons why we so far have only incorporated aluminum and titanium. So there, there is a very, it's very difficult to, uh, to find the data uh for for the metal so so uh, i think in most cases we, i i think we have uh, in most cases and even for the titanium we were not able to find the the uh, electron impact excitation cross sections for for the titanium and i think also elastic scattering we were not able to 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 find so uh, what uh, the, the way we go about this is that, for example, for titanium, uh, for the elastic scattering, I just uh, uh, look at the periodic table of elements and, and find a, a, a something similar. So in this case, I use the, the electron scattering cross-section for nitrogen uh, to replace the one for, uh, in case of the titanium one. So basically, this is how I, I do this. I try to, to see what is going on. If I don't find it, I try to come up with something. And for, for the excitations of the titanium, I, I just basically used some uh, textbook equations. And I think in this case, I used some equations from the book of uh, Liebermann and Lichtenberg. So, so basically, you have to really uh, try try out and make some kind of educated guess in cases you don't find the data. So it is basically uh, this is how you. But then you have to be aware of uh, looking at the result and think if it makes sense. Yeah. But it is basically you need to. In most of these cases, you need to make some educated guess. You, you just, uh, it is good to read the, like chapter three in, in the book of Lieberman and Lichtenberg, and then uh, try to uh, make up something that uh, makes a reasonable guess. But this is tricky. Yeah. Uh, my last question, uh, there is a, a very uh, new papers about bipolar high pins. Uh, yes. I, I imagine that it's uh, much more complicated to modeling bipolar high pins. Uh, even by a uh, uh, it's sputtering, it's uh, not so easy to model. Uh, uh, can you talk about a little ab about bipolar high pins, what it's different, uh, what it's statistics? in this uh, new kind of power supply? Yeah, so, so the bipolar high PIMS is, is a regular high PIMS where uh, 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 another pulse follows the main pulse and this second pulse is positive. So what it basically does, it increases the plasma potential in the ionization region and that means it pushes out the ions towards the substrate. And it seems to be that they have been able to demonstrate experimentally that you can basically, by, by the, the uh, 
amplitude of this uh, positive voltage, you can more or less control the ion energy of the ions as they hit the substrate. So this uh, can have some uh, benefits and, and uh, increases the controllability. We have, however, not really started to really think about modeling this. Mm. Uh, but, uh, but we have recently done some studies where we, we have been uh, playing with the shape of the pulse. So, so we, we have developed a, a, a model where we apply a, another negative pulse after the, the main pulse. Uh, to to play with the the the, uh, the uh, how much of neutrals we create to increase the deposition rate, but mm -hmm. the bipolar is when when the the voltage is reversed, and and we have not not really started to model this, but we are actually moving in this direction because we have started to pay more attention to the afterglow of this uh, original pulse and this has to be correct before we apply a positive okay. pulse so we are slowly moving in this direction but i don't know how far we we go with this because uh, yeah because i i think we still nobody still understands really what is happening in this when when the pull, pulse reverses but there is a lot of experimental work being done now, so maybe in a few months we will understand this better. Yeah. But okay. I, I, I would say that in general, we will now see uh, people adding pulses of different shapes after the original pulse to, to play with different properties. So I think that is what we, we will see in general for this. Yeah, probably. I, I agree with that. Uh, well, we do not have more more questions. I would like to thank you again. So it was a pleasure to see your lecture. I, I, I am sure that the students uh, like of it. So a lot of information. It's very good uh, to to listen to you and uh, all the details of the model. Uh, and and the, you can see I will post my, my view graphs on my homepage as I showed you here. Yes. And, yes. and all the references are here. Okay. So, so, so it is all there. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope that you can talk more and other days and when uh, uh, the pandemic is done, maybe we can, you can give us a lecture in, uh, here uh, in person to be, to be nice. That would so, be nice, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. I will finish okay. the transmission. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye.